Well, John's here, so everyone that we know is planning to be here is here. So let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. Um, we call to order this April 11 meeting of the Montpelier Planning Commission. First, we have to approve the agenda. So if I can get a motion to approve the agenda. Anybody? So moved. Okay, the motion from John, do we have a second? Second. Second from Jeff. Um, okay, those in favor of approving the agenda say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. I think that Aaron is not here yet. So that was like a 4-0 vote for the record. Um, he's just, he signed into the meeting, but um, has to be away for the beginning. Uh, and Gabe and Ariane are both out um, tonight. So this meeting is just a big update session. Um, the next item on the agenda is comments from the chair. Uh, so uh, my comments are that uh, tonight's, tonight's for updating and maybe preparing for what we're going to do in the short term. There's a, a few things that have come up. Um, and along with the things that have come up, um, we have Mike having a really busy time right now. So some of the prep work going toward the city plan is going to probably be slowed down. So um, maybe we can turn our focus in the short term on some of these other items um, and let him get caught up. Um, we're going to talk later about the city council uh, meeting that happened uh, a few weeks ago at this point and what went down um, and I'll have some, Michael have an update and then I'll have some like follow-up um, info and and some questions for the planning commission regarding what we wanna do uh, about that later. Um, so I'm gonna say what I had to say about that, but uh, there's some other things. Um, one thing is that we've gotten a request from the mayor. I just emailed everyone this, uh, uh, message from Ann that with an attachment from um, a community attorney named Diane Sherman, who is, who would ask the city council to look at this question of whether the DRB should be given the authority to possibly deny a permit based on the reputation of the history of the applicant. Um, there's interest in doing this because there's been some things in Vermont. There's a seven, it basically was a seven day story that exposed one particular business that uh, seemed to be a bad actor uh, in a lot of ways who's a, who does development work. And um, there's interest in not letting people or trying to prevent people from like that doing things in Montpelier. Uh, obviously this like legally is extremely thorny of an issue. This is, it's literally discrimination what they're asking us to do. And discrimination is sometimes okay, but um, it's definitely territory that we have to tread lightly with. Uh, so everyone should just take a look at the email I sent because you'll see Diane's request there. Um, she at least points out a few specific things that we could have the DRB consider. I think step, like since Anne's asked us to do this, we've got to do something about it. So we should have a discussion. I think we should have DRB come in and give their opinion before we do really much of anything. Um, and I think we should do some additional like reading up and research ourselves. At this point, which is you know extremely early on, my inclination is to try to avoid any legal troubles by just give do if to do if we're going to do anything, I, I would be in favor of something along the lines of giving the, DB, D, the DRB discretion to require a bunch of additional information when it comes to compliance issues from an applicant. So if they're not, if the DRB just in its own discretion, you can leave it in their discretion so that you're not calling out discrimination. So you're not saying like. If you think this applicant is shady, then ask for more information because that would look like, I don't know, something more legally troublesome. But if it's just in their discretion for whatever reason they want, they can adapt, ask for a bunch of additional information from an applicant. 
um, that gets at this without with while also sidestepping the legal issues that come with the discriminatory practice and it's just when you think someone's sketchy or shady that's like not a good legal basis for things and really opens you up to challenge so i would be inclined to if we're going to do something like this just give the drb some more tools to more thoroughly review an applicant and get additional information about compliance without actually getting into bad territory so that's kind of like what i'm thinking but we can look at this more look at what the options are this Diane says that the state has authority in some instances to deny an applicant based on compliance history, but I think in that case, it's probably compliance history with that particular agency, not maybe compliance history with like other towns and stuff like, so there, it might be some apples and oranges type stuff, but we'll have this whole thing to look at before I move on. I just want to see what people's thoughts are about us proceeding with this, how much time you think it's worth, if you think it's a good idea for us to pull D DRB, someone from the DRB in on our, the first time we ever talk about this, if, if that's what it sounds like you want to do, let me know. What, what do you guys want to do? So I can jump in real quick before Marcella goes, just to go through and say that we've, I've sent that my office sent this off to this, our city attorney, um, to review in about an hour before we we this meeting we got a, a written response as to what his recommendations would be for council. Um, I don't want to go into it right now. All the you know um, all the details. We've got a couple of questions that we want to get clarified first. Um, but a lot of Kirby's concerns are pretty much th the same concerns. Um, is that it really has to be tied to the land and the land use and the structures and the buildings, not in the, in the individual person. So we're going to try to get a little bit more clarity. And um, when that is in a form that um, is, I guess, shareable, um, you know, there's some attorney client things that are intended and written in such a way that it's really intended for, for our consumption um, and then there's some of it that's written for uh, public consumption. So we'll get through some of the clarifications and we'll get some of that out. And that I think will help dictate. I mean, it's always up to the boards, you know, the, the lawyers are giving recommendations and, um, and it's up to council and commissions to decide whether or not you want to take the advice of your legal counsel, <laughs> which I usually recommend you should do. Um, obviously, it'll, that'll be up to, up to them. But a little bit more of the background of the case. This is more than just um, uh, kind of an arbitrary, um, you know, potential. Um, so the, the issue that came up out of seven days was about the Bove brothers and some of their um, pro uh, properties that they own. They've been they're, uh, They not only own the Bove's restaurant and the Bove's pasta and the pasta sauce, but the family has also owned a number of rental units over the years, and those units have historically been low income um, and have been very problematic. Um, you know, it's a um, owning and operating low income housing is um, in as a for profit. Remember, he's doing low low income housing and um, you know without the low income tax credits and all the other benefits, so he's had a lot of problems. Um, I'm not going to make excuses for him. He's got a, a long history, but a lot of that has come out um, from those projects in Burlington and Winooski and a number of places. Um, and they are proposing, not they, one of the bro brothers um, is using his own money to go and decide to do uh, a market rate project on Northfield Street. And that's the one that has been getting a lot of attention. So opponents of the Northfield Street project um, want to give the DRB the power to deny this application. The application hasn't even been submitted yet, so, but they would like to have the DRB have the authority to deny this application before it's submitted based on the grounds that he has violations in other communities. And so that's, that's really kind of the nut that is we're, we're at right now. Um, and again, from my office's perspective, we are sitting on this as a legal 
question. Um, we'll see what comes back as the final legal recommendation. Um, and then up to at that point, it's up to a policy decision. Um, do we or don't we um, change the rules in this case? Um, and, and we'll see as we get going, um, you know, kind of what the recommendations are of, of the attorneys and whether or not this is something that's, that would even make a difference in this case. But it's a legal question. It'll be up to you guys to kind of make a first cut decision on, um, and then it'll be eventually up to city council to make a decision if they want to overrule or, or adjust what you guys come up with. So that gives you a little bit more context. Um, but yeah, look at look at her her note, and at some point there will be a legal um, a legal opinion from the city's attorney that will. So, so yeah, Mike, a couple couple of follow up things based on what you said then. For one, it sounds like maybe we'll need to do an executive session later so that we can review the legally confidential information. That's another possibility that we could do. We could we could organize uh, an executive session where we could discuss uh, attorney client privilege pieces. That would be the other option. So one option, eventually we've got to have something that goes to the public because we can't just not tell. Um, there's been a request from the public to, to address this issue. So at some point, we've got to come up with uh, something that will be public. We may go into executive yeah. session to discuss the, the details of the attorney client letter, but eventually there'll be a second letter that will be the, the public. And, and it may be the same letter. I don't know. I'm uh, Again, I usually rely on the opinion of our attorney. And if our attorney says there's nothing in here that's um, that's protected, we should just release the whole letter, then that's what we would do. Um, but again, okay. that, it's so, over okay. my so, pay so grade on this one. Yeah, it, gets to, it gets to Bill, yeah, yeah. Uh, Bill Fraser. It's, it's and fine. So, so yeah, there's a possibility of an executive session for us to review that. Obviously, yeah, I mean, it'll be public eventually, but it's just if there's any details that for whatever reason we can't speak about publicly, just to make sure we're all informed, we need, we'll need we need to do that. Um, or as it, if it turns out that we don't need to do it, that's fine too. Um, that'll just be like one step. Um, there's also an issue here about the timing of when the law or uh, the timing of how this should go down if this is literally in response to one potential application, then that application could get in before before the city council does anything to change the law. And if anything, this whole thing could backfire because if if we say that some big new changes need to happen and then the application gets in before that, then that actually gives the applicant the ability to argue, well, none of that stuff's already in the law because why would they be proposing it if if the DRB could already review those things. So it would almost be like telling the DRB what they can't look at. Um, so I, I don't know, there's that issue yeah, too. There, the, yeah, there'll be a timing issue in there. I mean, obviously if they get their application in before this amendment got approved, then the amendment would be moot in their case anyways. Um, right, yeah, exactly. And like I said, rules. it could backfire. Yeah. But, um, so, so that's one thing to consider here. Uh, okay, and Marcella, what did you have? What, what thoughts did you have on this? Just that it might be nice to have. Well, it sounds like we have. I was just going to respond to your question about involving somebody from the DRB, which I would appreciate. And it sounds like we have other things to do before that, though. Anyways. So. Yeah, I think I think we could possibly do those things at the same time if we plan a meeting where um, so Mike, you'll just have to let us know uh, when you think you'll be ready to talk about the legal advice stuff. And then I, it could be helpful in that same meeting to have someone from the DRB speak and just kind of handle it all at once. The city council is going to want some decent turnaround on this. That's one reason why I'd probably like to do those things together. And, and we just and we got to think we could about try to have it for them. We could try to have it for the next planning commission meeting. Um, try to get that arranged. I mean, there's not a lot of work on my part to, to get that set up. Uh, as I said, I think we we probably would have had um, things a little bit more prepared for tonight had had I gotten it a little bit more in advance because I do have a couple of questions I want clarified. You know, um, by our attorney before going out, it, it, you know, he kind of lays out a, a, a pretty clear box that says, this is the box that you can be in. 
and there's kind of just one or two questions of, okay, you didn't actually expressly say that's the box, but is that really what you're saying? So I just want to get a few clarification points. If I had those, I then then we could follow up. We could have had that more more discussion tonight, but I think the best we could do is to wait, and get it on the agenda for next time, and um, see where that goes. I think that sounds good. Um, just just to for the planning commissioners, you know, there's going to be certain legal boundaries we want to stay within, which is what the legal advice is going to help with. But then there's going to be other policy issues that I'm assuming that the legal advice isn't going to go into, but we should be thinking about like uh, the chilling effects or the the possibility of whatever we come up with being too broad so that um, it's applying to people we don't intend it to. Um, but like I was saying before, I think leaving something up to the DRB discretion, I think is, is a good approach. I think we tend to have a very reasonable DRB. So, okay. Does anybody else have anything on this or are we just content to wait until it's on the agenda? Okay. Uh, the other thing I had that um, I was gonna bring up and I, I can revisit this in, in context later on when we're talking about the uh, uh, city council stuff and the updates from, from what's going on there. But um, it's it's not entirely related. So I think I'll bring it up now. I th I think that um, it might be a good idea for us sometime soon to write an article for the Bridge or the Times Argus or both, where we pull in some other committees like the Housing Task Force and CJAC, um, and have uh, like a multiple city commit like policy related committees um, to discuss a, the housing need and kind of get the word out about the direction that we're hoping things will go in soon. Um, we'll get to it later, but we need we need to do some better um, outreach to to make people committed to like housing as an issue and to make sure that 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 whatever like fear-based concerns are out there or whatever um mb based concerns are out there don't like win the day in the long run so um we'll get to that later but i just want to just throw that out there as its own thing and, and about what that could entail but that's something i'll probably i'll probably do a, a draft thing for next time a, a draft letter um the, with the idea being we work on that then we pass it to those other committees and ask them to modify it as they want and then to sign on to it so that it's a kind of a group thing. Um, okay. I guess I won't ask for your opinions on that until we, until you understand better what I'm talking about. Uh, next on the agenda is general business. Does anybody else have any comments that are not on the agenda before we move on? Just if any planning commissioners have anything. Okay, general business uh, where we can discuss comments from the public about something not on the agenda. Um, there's no members of the public here. Are there any there with you, Mike? No. Okay, so we can move on. Uh, staff updates. Um, Mike has five updates. Um, so I hand it to you, Mike. All right, so this will be most of the meeting um, because we don't have the economic development chapter to review. Um, you know, my apologies for been very busy and um, add to that being very sick. So uh, it's good to be back and feeling a lot better. And so thank everybody for your patience. Um, so the first update um, I wanted to let you guys know about is a community and economic development specialist job search. So we did hire uh, Josh Jerome. Some of you may know him. He is, a, uh, he is actually local. He had worked for the Berry Partnership. He worked for Community Capital. And most recently, he'd been working for the town of Randolph as their um, economic development coordinator. So he's got a great deal of experience. He is a Montpelier resident. Uh, kind of very surprised that we, we ended up finding somebody locally. Um, and so we are really looking forward to having him uh, get on board and kind of get going. He'll start in May. So 
did want to say we did fill that position. It's it's challenging to, to fill positions nowadays. So it was good that we got somebody uh, experienced and uh, also local, so we don't have to find a house for them. Um, so the second thing is, um, so municipal planning grant award. So actually after being denied our municipal planning grant in the fall, um, the legislature decided they would go through and allocate extra money to the municipal planning grant program to help fund projects that had been not funded. So um, municipal planning grants are really the basis of so much that goes on and uh, this it got hit really hard back in 2008 2009 when when the recession hit everybody in federal in the state government got cut and then eventually by about 2012 they came back and celebrated and said everybody's back to fully funded except for municipal planning grants um, municipal planning grants used to be almost a million dollars and had been cut to I don't know, 300 and something and they got it up to about 400 and something and it kind of sat there so it really um, really kind of decimated the consulting field uh, and so it also so it made a big difference there but we've always been waiting for those numbers to come back up so this year they finally restored all the funding to municipal planning grants so that's that's a good sign so this year they did put some additional money back in and we got awarded so we had put in a municipal planning grant to hire a consultant to help us develop the the web side of our city plan we've talked about wanting to do this digital plan we want it web-based we want it with storyboards um, and it was going to cost some money and we had twenty thousand dollars set aside well we now have an additional ten so we now have thirty thousand dollars so this kind of ties in directly to the next one which is the rfp for hiring a consultant we had a ton of interest in our project i bet i sent out 20 copies of our rfp i got contacted you know, all over Vermont, all over New England, um, and places far flung across the country about interest in our project. And ultimately, we got one application um, from a local company uh, who's been working with the city in the past. So we'll have some questions that'll come up about whether or not, because we've got the extra 10,000, do we re put the RFP back out for a second cut because it's got an extra $10,000 now? Or do we kind of review the, you know, the folks that, that did come in? Um, and so we'll have to kind of make a decision. I know John was interested in helping out to review it. Maybe we'll take a look at that first proposal and see if it meets what we want. And if not, maybe we put that RFP back out knowing that we've got an extra $10,000. And maybe that'll make a difference and we'll get a few more um, folks to, to put in a proposal. So. Um, unfortunately, we got awarded the MPG on Friday, and these were due on Monday, so we really didn't get an opportunity to send out a notice to to applicants to give them a chance to revise their proposals. Um, had we gotten it a week or so earlier, it would have given us a chance to kind of send out a notice to everybody who had requested a copy of the RFP to let them know we had extra money and that maybe that would get a few more applicants. But that's where that sits right now. Um, so we do have extra money. Uh, I am confident we'll have somebody. Uh, the question is whether we're going to put this out to re-put this out to bid again. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions on that before I jump into the council hearing update. So the fourth piece is our council hearing update. Uh, I know Kirby was there and I think I saw Aaron in for a, a bit of time. Uh, it was uh, not as not as bad as I thought, but it was still very long, um, and it was uh, we we did get a lot of comments. And I'll skip to the skip to the end, which is that what council ended up voting on doing was to remove number eight from the proposal, which was the um, residential removing residential density from 1500 and riverfront districts so that was that proposal was struck um, and most of the public comments we got were focused on that that specific proposal um, and i think kirby uh, and i tried to to 
at least explain things. Um, so I did put together a memo, follow-up memo, which outlined a couple of points um, that is going to city council um, to kind of cl clarify a few things that kind of maybe got misrepresented by folks in the public that, um, so uh, I guess I'll go quickly step-by-step step through that memo. Um, so it really looked at four items. One was there was a, com a complaint by one resident that all of the changes, a lot of the changes are not consistent, uh, not in conformance with the master plan. Master plan that was adopted in 2017. So uh, I have written a memo and outlined and taken about three or four pages to do it to kind of outline what conformance with the plan means, how this is in conformance with the plan. Uh, ultimately, it's up to city council to make that decision. But I, I don't think I'm very comfortable that everything we've done is in conformance with the plan because really conformance with the plan legally is, is, is a two step process. And it really looks at if if you're making us, whether it's a zoning change or whether it's a program, whether it's a project, um, if you're doing something, the question is, if it's in conformance with the plan, does it help achieve uh, one of the policies in the plan? You don't have to meet all of them and you don't have to negatively, you know, not negatively impact any of them. So, you know, as I point out in my memo, if you have 100 policies and a proposal only helps to implement 99 of those 100, but hinders one, um, you know, that, that, that's an impossible bar to meet for, for every proposal because your master plan looks at so many things that inherently, there's inherent conflicts within it. Um, you know, our downtown is a floodplain. If you wanna do economic development in our downtown, you're doing more development in our floodplain. And so you're balancing these two competing things, uh, historic preservation and um, energy efficiency. You know, should we remove those historic windows to put in energy efficient windows? It's a balancing act. You, you sometimes have to accomplish one while hindering the other. But what's required is that you have a goal of more housing or more energy efficiency. You have to be accomplishing one of the goals. Now, if what you're doing does not is not discussed at all in the plan, then you go to the second step of the process, which is, does it negatively impact something? Um, then, you know, if it's not supporting, a, if it's not supporting or hindering anything, then it's in conformance with the plan. Um, so it's kind of this two-step process. That's the way it's looked at. Um, so I'm comfortable because we have a number of, of housing related goals that are proposals that help to increase housing are sufficient um, and that we we are in conformance with the proposals that we presented so that was the first piece um, the second piece i talk about really briefly is that there's a lot of times um, and we heard it sometimes in our hearings and it came up again in the city council hearings was this idea that they don't need to adjust the dense you don't need to adjust the densities of these neighborhoods because they could simply do a um, cottage cluster and double their density and that just kept coming up. It's like, well, you know, Heaton Street could do a cottage cluster and double their density and they can get all the units that they need, except the proposal is to do everything inside one building, which by definition is not a cottage cluster. So they can't double it. So you have to stop this argument of, well, they can just do a cottage cluster. Well, that's not what they want to do. Um, you know, well, um, Northfield Street can just do a cottage cluster, but that's not what they want to do. They don't want to do a cottage cluster. Um, so. That's the, that is a little bit of the, the thing just to go through and make sure the council was clear on that. Um, the third piece was to get into what I was just talking about earlier, number eight. I know it's been removed. This is why, and this is my opinion. I, I, I wanted to write it because there's been a lot of letters and things that have kind of um, put my name to things that I don't necessarily agree with. Um, because I, I disagreed with the Planning Commission on the recommendation, I therefore um, had these opinions. And so I just wanted to clarify what my opinion was and why um, and what I was concerned about in our rules. Um, and that I wasn't concerned about people demolishing whole neighborhoods to replace them with flat-roofed giant buildings. I don't think that's going to happen. 
I think we've got plenty of rules in place to protect it, but I think there are other things that could be um, at issue. Um, so that was my third point. And my final point was with um, the other change that city council made, which was that they struck your amendment to our amendment to the shading requirement. Remember, we went and said, currently you can't shade somebody else's walls, roofs, or yards. So you can't shade anybody's yard on December 21st. Um, and so we all agreed. We looked at a bunch of options and we said, we're just gonna protect existing and proposed solar facilities, solar devices. Um, well, they didn't like that, so they just eliminated it. Um, and my memo to them in the fourth part of my memo goes through and says, that's really not good enough. Um, the issue is that you're going to have, you're going to make single story infill. We want infill, but it's going to have to be single story so it doesn't create shade and it's going to have to be moved. And there's a lot of issues that leaving the rules as they are written is going to be a problem for. So we need to change it. And so I'm giving them a list of the six things. All right. So if you don't like what the planning commission proposed, um, and they got a lot of comments from, um, the public on that. Well, maybe not a lot. Uh, a, a handful of people were very vocal and very um, emphatic about the importance of solar access and uh, shading trespass and, and a bunch of things. So um, I just wanted to go through and give them some options that said, here's where you can look to try to fix this. Um, if you don't like what Planning Commission came up with, here are some other options. What, what are the options? Or Mike or uh, John, go ahead. I was just going to ask, this is something you're giving them. And if so, would it be helpful maybe to have some visuals on how our current um, our current rules are um, or maybe worse for solar access because trees are much taller than what we allow for buildings. So for example, my solar panels are blocked by trees that are within the setback. If there was a building there, they would not be. So I think we can show, you know, the net um, solar access. There, there would be a gain in like net solar access if uh, there was an increase in building. So it's, you know, it's hypothetical and depends on the, the certain situation, but I think the rule as it is written now is not, it serves more just to prevent uh, development and not, not at all related to, to solar access really. That's a great point. So anyways, I, I guess I'm asking, would it be helpful to have any visuals that show shading? Yeah, I mean, if we've got some, that would be helpful. I just emailed the memo to you guys, so um, I probably should have sent that out on Friday when I was wrapping it up for council, but you guys can have copies just to see what, what I sent out. Oh, and I was going to open it up so I could read to you what the options were that I sent them. So, me... so one thing one thing that we could do tonight is decide if the Planning Commission would like to do anything about the solar shading question. The the number eight, the density thing, that's that's dead for now. But we'll, we'll we'll return to that, and I'll be talking about that later in this meeting. But for the solar shading, that's not necessarily "quote unquote" dead for now. Um, there's something that could be done at the meeting two days from now about that, and we could still possibly save our proposal on that. Um, that, and I'm basing that off of what, how I understood the way that City Council was discussing it. Um, they're still undecided, basically, about solar shading. They just kind of set it aside for the first meeting. The, the density thing, they um, they they set it aside, but they said, like, we want the Planning Commission to come back with a more thorough thing for this. Um, but for the solar shading, they're still deciding what they're going to do. So it's not too late at all for, like, Mike has sent um, info, which he just sent to us, uh, about what he said to them about solar shading. But we could send our, we could get in touch with them ourselves um, with a recommendation if we want. And also, individuals can get in touch with them too. Like if John Adams wants to um, reach out. So just like um, 
however you guys want to want to do it we we have some options and it's not too late on the solar shading issue yeah so i i gave them six options one of which was what you guys had proposed so uh, limiting the area of impact to just roofs or just to walls in roofs so basically taking the yards out of it um, adjusting the language to require minimizing or mitigating the effects of shading currently it says um, prohibiting shading uh, with they could exempt more high density zoning districts from the requirement currently urban center one two three and riverfront are exempt from the shading requirement but we could exempt a few more higher density districts um, the lower density districts have larger setbacks and less likely to have shading issues uh, change the time of year that the analysis is considered i mean we're talking about no gardens are going to be growing on december 21st when the shadows are the longest so right now if you're you know if you make a shadow for 10 square feet only during three days in december that's going to result in a denial of a zoning permit um, and that doesn't make any sense really in my view um, we could add waiver language for the drb to make a case-by-case -case review based on the potential impacts of the shading again it, it starts to make things a little bit more complicated but that's that's certainly a way to go if we've got some clear guidance as to what waivers should be approved and what waivers should not that's okay or apply the rules narrowly to existing and proposed solar devices which is what you guys had proposed and and we put in the rules so um, and then I said the Planning Commission felt that the dense urban setting such as Montpelier um, in a dense urban area such as uh, Montpelier that it is going to be unreasonable to expect no shading of any portion of a neighboring property. It is especially true when we desire in some cases require multi-story structures. Many of our neighborhoods have old well-developed tree cover which already shade areas and slopes on many properties have other features that make development in a proposed shade area unlikely or impossible. While I understand you do not wish to take the recommendation of the Planning Commission on how to solve the problems, I do believe that leaving the bylaws as written is, um, I do not believe that leaving the bylaws as written is appropriate. There will be consequences to future projects that I believe will run counter to city council priorities. So um, I think we, we've kind of set the stage. Um, for them to, to reconsider it. I hope they will. But um, there, there is certainly a vocal minority of folks who really are um, very much concerned about the shading issue. So we'll see where that goes. So those were the four issues. You guys now have a copy of the memo. So uh, Planning Commission, uh, so while we're on this item, I, I'm, I tend to think it would be a good idea for us to back up what Mike's saying with our own contact to, to the city council on this. Um, question is how to go about doing that. Um, we could, I would be willing to write it up and send it out by tomorrow so they get it at least the day before if they're deciding on Wednesday. Um, then again, if someone else wants to write it, that's totally fine with me too. Um, I know, you know, John's the most informed on, on this, I think, um, out of all of us, we would need to gather what we want that to say right now. And then just, in, and then just delegate that to, to one of us to, to get in touch for the group. Does that sound like something you guys want to do? And if so, let's talk about what we want to make sure is included if we do that. Seems fine. Does that does that sound fine to you, John, or do you like, or do you think another approach would be more helpful? I'm just thinking what. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it sounds fine to me. Um, I just uh, didn't realize it was like this Wednesday, so I have uh, limited time to pull something together. Yeah, the reason why I haven't reached out since the last meeting is that um, in the in the first meeting of city council, they they asked Mike for more info. So they asked him for the memo we just sent them. So I was waiting for that in order to figure out what what we were going to do, if anything. Um, and I wasn't sure if we were going to end up having more time. Uh, but 
if we want to defend our original recommendation, then we can write the letter for that. Or we can look at these things that Mike said, and we could, or we could do both. We could say, we really think our original recommendation is going to be the best thing for the city. But if you want to compromise this in any way, follow these, you know, X, Y, and Z that, that Mike is saying here, um, something like that. Uh, so he's, you know, he's put out limiting the area of impact to just roofs, not yards. Just the language to require minim minimizing or mitigating effects. Exempting high density zoning districts. Change the time of year. Adding waiver language. Applying the rules narrowly to existing and proposed solar devices. You can pick any or all of those things, or if we have anything additional to add. Um, it sounds, it sounds kind of like it might not be wise to say, to defend the original if they've already said that that's not what they're gonna do. I don't. They, 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 haven't, they haven't necessarily like said that they refusing, they're refusing it. The, from what I remember, there were only two or three people who came out against this. Maybe there was more, but I'm just considering considering like so much nastiness was surrounding the density thing that like it's like I almost don't remember anybody talking about this really because it was like really drown out. Um, but there's one or two city councilors who are worried about so, like they want to see solar development. So um, I think that's where the hesitation is coming from. That there's actually people in the city council who were wanting to see solar happen. So I believe that if you point out to those people, what we're trying to tell you is actually helpful for solar, it just might not be intuitive, that would go a long way. Yeah, are we qualified to make that, to describe that? I mean, can Jonathan, we say this would be a good thing for solar? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. I think 100, 100%, like, um, which is why I want to, want to create the the graphic to explain it but basically i mean you'd also say or explain you know most if this regulation was in place before anything was built in montpelier or most homes if we were asked people to come into compliance with this we would have to take down most homes and buildings in montpelier and there would be very little gained in terms of solar access Again, because most of the shading is provided by trees, but also roofs are the the preferred location for um, for photovoltaic panels. Anyway, so John, like you definitely seem the most educated about this. Um, I don't want to throw it on you to write a letter for us, but I mean, I, I I'm willing to help, and I'm sure some of others are willing to help. What? I think as far as the illustration thing or the graphic goes, it's like, yeah, I don't think, I don't know if we have time to throw a graphic together, but what we could do is we could go to the city council meeting and explain it like a graphic, like just to try to visualize what you're saying. So I, th I think for one thing, for you to go and to speak would, would be huge um, if you're free Wednesday. And it's gonna, they're probably not gonna get to this until late-ish, just so you know. It's going to be probably post bedtime in your house. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I will be able to uh, um, try to work on something like right now. Um, OK, uh, well, I mean, I can go and, and try. Um, but if you could put down like if you could put down bullet points of like the main points to say, I could turn that into something written if you want. Um, Okay, let me see if I can work up a graphic during this meeting and then put some bullet points down. Okay, yeah, and that's good. And, and um, is everyone okay with... Um, it, okay, does anyone else want to be included in, in writing this letter for Wednesday? And at the same time, I encourage everyone to, sh to show up on Wednesday to, to talk about it. The first yeah. question was... Yeah, go ahead, um, Jeff. So I'll jump in. Um, I'm certainly would love to attend Wednesday, um, more so to highlight the trade-off between, 
I don't know, let's say an environmental goal like more solar panels and a housing goal, um, you know, the social and economic side of that, and really make that uh, trade off clear to the council that they can't, uh, well, solar panels aren't a panacea for our problems and it might be good to build some more homes in the, uh, or whatever development in the uh, shade be damned, you know. Yeah, I think another good point that it's, to some of us, this is obvious, but I think it needs to be said out loud more often. If we're doing things that prevent housing from getting built here, then they're going to get built. Housing will be built somewhere else that does not have all of the great environmental regulations that we have. So, um, you know, that's that's it's easy to forget, like when we when we're trying to do these things that we think are good for the environment, but we're actually hurting it. Um, Okay, well, that's great, Jeff, if you want to go to talk to that. Um, are, are you guys okay with delegating to John and I? Does anybody else want to be involved in the, in the writing of the letter? Okay, I'm not hearing anyone. So, so um, can we get a motion to delegate that Kirby and John draft a letter regarding solar shading for the city council for Wednesday? I'll make that motion. Okay, so we have a motion from Marcella that, that John and I draft a letter stating the Planning Commission's position on solar shading um, to you know represent all of our voices in this. Um, do we have a second? John or Jeff or Farron's here? Do we have a second? Uh, second. second. Okay, so I heard from John first. We have a second to that. Uh, those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Okay, so Aaron's here. So uh, that was five ayes. Uh, any opposed? Okay, so that's what that's what we'll we'll do for the Wednesday meeting. Um, we'll John and I will prepare something. We'll send it along before the city council meeting on Wednesday, and then. As far as the solar shading issue goes, I encourage everyone to show up um, in support of that. Uh, one problem at the last meeting was I personally did not know where the animosity was going to be directed. So I didn't know how to really prepare adequately for backing up our recommendations. Like for instance, we kind of thought maybe Northfield Street would be attacked, like the proposal there, like number three in our memo. It wasn't really. Surprisingly, um, even though that was the experience during our hearings, was most of the space was taken up for that issue. Uh, it, you know, so it was a learning experience for us. And uh, as far as the solar shading being something that got that got picked on a little bit, it's, it's not too late. Well, I okay, think Mike, we, go ahead. Sorry, just uh, I was just thinking. You know, we we need we need to understand why we wanted why we brought the changes that we brought anyways but i don't i think we ought to be careful about responding too directly to comments i mean we can i think we respond to broad concepts right brought up by comments but not comments in particular so i just couldn't quite tell from what you were just saying it sounded like maybe you were wanting to respond to directly to people and i think that's not a good idea no no that's that's not what i'm saying um i was what i was what i was saying what i meant was uh, you know, when it comes to the political side of this, we have to uh, be good advocates for ourselves, you know, and and if we're making suggestions, um, we do have to be proactive in advocating why we are and explaining why and actually being part of that conversation. Um, and we didn't do that at the last meeting, which I don't think that a mistake was made. But I think it would be a mistake, like if we continue to do that and we allow like misinformation in the community, for instance, to rule the day. So just being proactive in, in defending our own message. But in no way am I talking about responding directly to people. I'll say this, though, and, and I, I might get into this more when we're talking about the, the density stuff in a minute. But um, I do have some misgivings because I, 
because Marcella, like my attitude generally is I'm, if something's kind of an absurd claim, then a dignifying it with a response actually gives it credibility. And I think that's a bad thing to do. But so I think that, and that sounds similar to, or at least part of what you're saying about responding specifically to things. But um, to my surprise, we, uh, we have a couple of new city councilors and at least one comment was made by one of them where they seem to believe some of the things that were factually incorrect that were have been claimed at the um, at these hearings at the city council hearings so i'm starting to think that not responding to individuals but addressing things that i that i normally would think well i don't need to address that because on its face it's not accurate apparently i've got a reassess that assumption because um yeah well i was just thinking i mean yeah we it, it makes sense to me to address things that are factually not accurate or mischaracterizations or something but we can't i mean there's too many people to, to respond to everybody so that, that was more what i was thinking we, we don't have the bandwidth the capacity the time to respond to every comment yeah and my my approach about that is actually i think it's a matter of like noise and like whether whether a f like a, a minority of voices is drowning out like a majority opinion because the majority is not like we just got to make sure there's other voices at these things that are speaking because we know that they exist in our community we know there's a lot of pro-housing advocates we hear from those people from um, time to time and they're passionate but you know for instance when it comes to this they weren't at that last meeting and so it sounded like you know it, it sounded like a lot of like a lot of our community was had a, a particular opinion when I, my belief is that actually that was a small minority of the community but those were just the only people there so just just being aware of that just to having more voices um involved is you know something that we can do a better job of, of leading about well I, I shouldn't even say better job because it sounds like i'm being critical i'm just saying like when it matters we need to do a good job with it and not and not um like i don't think we've done anything wrong so far It sounds like we're in agreement though. Yeah. Yeah, just, just from a process standpoint, so people understand a lot of times when I'm, when I'm doing it, I've, I have to kind of take my cues from the counselors and the mayor and whoever. So unfortunately I had a couple of times I, I really wanted to respond to the shading stuff, but they weren't asking me my opinion. So I was a, a little bit boxed out and I was trying to get their attention to ask me, um, but I couldn't get them to ask me my opinion on what was being said. So by the time, you know, they, they moved forward and made their, their votes and their decisions. So, um, so it is tricky. There, is, there are a little bit more opportunities, as Kirby said, um, to provide public input that I sometimes can't. Um, if I get asked, um, you know, sometimes there's a comment that goes to the council and the council will ask me to, to respond. But if they don't ask me to respond, I, I am really not at, at liberty to kind of jump in. So um, that's just, just if, you, if you see me not jumping in, that's sometimes why. It's because there's an expectation that I'm to be addressed before I, um, so, sometimes I will if it's something critical, but... Um, yeah, just, thanks. Thanks for pointing that out, Mike. And, and just so you know, I mean, I, I was aware of that when, at the meeting. Um, the, and I also felt a little frustrated later on in the meeting when they didn't return to ask you to address any of the things that they seem to be basing some decisions on. Um, yeah, that, but that, that wasn't on you. They just didn't ask. Uh, did you have any, you had more things on your... Uh, well, um, that was council hearing unless people want okay. to talk about the the residential yeah piece. yeah I, um, I do i do so while we're on this item i want to uh, focus on the other part of the um, council hearing because there's there's a quite a bit of repercussions from from the meet from from the hearing so um so mike told you guys a lot of the details of things um the meeting went really late so i'm not sure I know that that I think I was the only planning commissioner that was there by the end of it. I mean, it, it was like midnight ish. Um, I think it was it. eleven, um, but yeah, it was getting there. I well, I, I remember like I was I was definitely past midnight when I was right. Like the city council asked me for some additional info, and I definitely emailed them past midnight. 
Um, and it's like after the thing was finally over. Um, so, uh, okay. There, so what, so what happened going into that meeting was, uh, there was a couple of members of the community who reached out to people. There was one person who went door to door with flyers about the number eight issue. Um, it, it seems like this is my interpretation of how it seemed to have gone that because number eight was an issue in which Mike didn't have the same exact opinion as, as us, that that was perceived as a weakness that could be attacked. Um, I, I do think that, I mean, and I've, I'm speculating, I admit that, um, but I feel like it was because based on what we, the feedback we heard during the hearings was about lots of different things, but then the tone at the city council hearing was number eight's the problem and then there was even claims because because mike had mentioned the congress for new urbanism in his um memo that there were there were claims that like we were going against the congress for new urbanism which is like the opposite of the truth um because th these were people who were you know trying to defeat this idea with congress for new urbanism is telling us that we should do this citywide um so so it was it was it was kind of rough and it was targeted and um and you know folks were definitely like marshalling forces uh that's without question is like is how that happened and they chose their topic you know after our hearings had already taken place i think um the takeaway though is we have this report from congress for new urbanism that's asking us to look at several big changes to our zoning. The number one on the CNU list was density caps. And they're unequivocal in telling us that they, those are unhelpful. And just like every major planning think tank or resource would be probably saying that too. It's just textbook, not helpful um, for promoting housing and the development that you want and meeting the goals that you want um, under if you have a city plan like ours. So uh, what I think we should do, and, and this is what city council directed us to do, was to reconsider and look at the density stuff. I think that it makes sense to do that in the context of reviewing the Congress for New Urbanism's um, proposals. We should do that sooner rather than later. Have a uh, very um, uh, well-developed proposal based on all of that, it's, I would think that it's going to be much more drastic than the this proposal that was just removed, which was just to take out density caps in two neighborhoods. I think Congressman New Urbanism is asking for much, much, much more than that. So I think we should do that. And I think that we should do it with accompany that work with some outreach. Um, I think the, the article that I was talking about before would be a good first step of outreach just to show the public that there's a lot of voices on the city's committees um, who are serious about housing solutions and to, and to get that word out first. Then when we come up with these, um, our recommendations based on Congress New Urbanism. Ideally, it would be something in which we all are in agreement on it's a, the entire planning commission and something that, that Mike's also comfortable with and um, forward this as a unified voice. And at the same time, marshal our own forces, so to speak, as in to let, like we know there are housing advocates around and, and each of us individually know them. And then as a planning commission, we know some and letting those people know that, hey, this is being proposed and in, we we do need you to, to go with let city council know um, that that there's voices in this community that want this because I think that when it came down to it, my takeaway from the last hearing was uh, they were just hearing from one minority of people and it made it seem magnified and if we drown out some of that with our own um, approach then that's that's what we need to do and I'm confident that we can do a lot to bring forward housing solutions if we take the steps we need to take to to make sure the city council is aware of the support that's behind us. So I'm thinking about that. I'm also thinking about um, so so we'll need to take up the Congress for New Urbanism stuff 
pretty soon. Um, there's a few takeaways, by the way, uh, just as, as a general awareness thing. We were kind of attacked by some people for, apparently in our memo, we used a gender pronoun uh, when referring to a member of the public. So um, that, and then, and then in the comments that were, the written comments that were received, that was attacked. So I guess from now on, we should just be aware that if we're writing anything in which we're responding um, to a specific member of the public and what they said, then we should not use a gendered pronoun. Um, that seems like an easy accommodation to make sure that people don't feel offended. Um, I actually, in general, I, I don't even know how helpful it is to respond to specific people when we talk about the hearings. This kind of goes to maybe, I don't, I don't know if that's what Marcel was getting at before or not, but um, speaking generally about the input we receive rather than, than talking to about a single person, I don't think it's, so in the future, whenever we're writing that stuff, I think that's just like a good lesson there because um, I'm not saying that we did anything wrong at all, I'm, but I do think that it just added more muddiness and nastiness to this whole thing. It was pretty nasty, I feel like, by the way, just to make that clear. Um, it, it got personal and nasty and then people were acting like they were offended because we were personal and nasty, but I didn't feel like we tried to be as professional as possible, but that's kind of, we should just be aware that, that people could, some people will respond that way in the future. Um, another thing that happened after the meeting was I met with Lauren, who's a city councilor. I had asked all the city council if they were interested in, in learning more about what we're up to, that I would be available um, to talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Lauren was the only one who took me up on it, but uh, we had a nice talk where we walked around town and I showed Lauren, um, for instance, I showed Lauren the, the development that's on Cedar Street that is always pointed out as the quote unquote ugliest thing in town and that the worst case scenario, if we allow more housing, there's gonna be Cedar Street. And then, because every time I look at Cedar, Cedar Street, I'm really confused because I, I'm from East Tennessee and if that building was in a town in East Tennessee, that'd be the prettiest building in town. So I'm just like kind of confused. And like, she was kind of in agreement about like, this is our worst case scenario. It's like, apparently this is our worst case scenario is this building that provides housing to multiple families is just, um, so we had, a, we had a good talk. She was, she was in um, agreement with uh, the direction that we're going, for instance. Um, I did talk to her about the solar shading issue because she is a person that's concerned about the solar shading. And I also just knowing that about future struggles, I also brought up to her that in our um, in our city plan that we're working on now, if, you, if everyone remembers, we had uh, the version that, or, or what we're suggesting right now in the city plan is that uh, we kind of scaled back how much we're going to require uh, energy efficiency and new development because there was a proposal to have really strong energy efficiency requirements in new development, which is part of the energy plan. But we thought for housing that that was going to be too difficult. So we scaled that back, if you remember. I went ahead and let her know about it because I feel like that's going to be something that the city council is going to be worried about. So I went ahead and put a bug in her ear about like, this is something that could really be harmful to housing. And we know that it's a major, it's also part of a major energy goal. So this is a big tension. And I went ahead and got her feedback now. And she talked about if having, inter, having energy efficiency um, encouraged, but putting a cap on how much extra expense could come with that for new development or something like that was like what she was thinking. So I th I'm thinking that that's going to be like a common ground thing that we're going to end up doing. So that's that's way fast forward into the fall when um, the city council's looking at our city plan stuff. But um, I, I thought that was helpful to bring up. So we, we had a good talk. Um, she's She said that, you know, she's going to try to be an ally with the city council to help them understand. I explained the policy stuff behind density caps and why uh, they're not helpful for our goals, but then they're, uh, or they're hurtful for our goals and they're, and they're not helpful for making the neighborhood look any certain way because that's not what they're regulating. And so, so we talked all about that. Um, so, so she thought it would be a good idea for us to do this article thing with the other um, committees. 
and uh, I think that's I think that's all I've got. So it, I know that was a lot of, of stuff, but the takeaway is let's take up let's take up the CNU thing. Let's put together a good proposal quickly and get back to them. They they are asking we get back to them on it, um, and and revisit that. But but now that we know what we're facing, we can we can go into that prepared. Does anybody have any questions about any of that? Then we may not be able to go for our ideal. In, in removing the density caps, but we may be able to find some other ways of, we may be able to remove density caps, but do other things. Again, that in general, if you were asking me on a, on a, on a plain open thing, I would say no, but if you remove, let's say you remove density caps, but then make multifamily a conditional use. Well, that helps to t kind of take the blunt off the top. So, so we're not going to look at how big the parcel is to decide how many units you can have. But it, once you go to five units, then it becomes a character of the use issue. Now, of course, you and I can all go and say, yeah, but if they're putting multifamily into an existing house and nothing is changing on the exterior of the house, why do we have to have this go to conditional use? But again, we may just have to work with there's there are a number of ways to get to the same place that we might be able to remove the density caps and still put some other guardrails on that help people feel better and that's not necessarily great but sometimes you know that's what we have we have to do sometimes to get these rules passed but it's something we can all sit down and kind of talk about you know how we want to propose what we want to propose how we want it to, to try to go as options um, but there's certainly other ways that we can get where we want to get to um, and, and open things up a little bit more without maybe, you know, got to make a little sausage sometimes. Um, the, the thing is, Mike, though, is um, the, the density caps and continuing to rely on density as like a major part of how we regulate things is it's, it's flawed in and of itself. And it's also clearly like the people in our community who don't want development use density as their weapon, as their proxy all of the time. And there's a lot of misinformation and confusion about what it means right now. So it's just for, for a lot of reasons, I just want to move away from density. By the way, one other thing that came up and one thing I would like for us to look at when we're considering the CNU's recommendations is this is, it's, it's, it's just a superficial change, but I think I think it, it's important because it gets us away from having the wrong kind of conversations. I think we should actually change the names of our, our neighborhoods and the zonings to remove the reference to density. Because right now, I mean, that's actually like our neighborhoods are named after their density designation, which makes people believe that density is like real, that important, that they're named that way. And I think it was a name of convenience. It's not meant to have some substantial meaning behind it. But it's just another thing that in people's minds, they think that zoning means density and that's the most important thing when that's like, we just have a long way to go as far as people correctly understanding what the stuff means. So that's that's why I want to tackle it. I want, if someone's against development in town, I want them to come and talk about, okay, um, right now they can just say like density's bad and like make up worst case scenarios and if, if they didn't have that option they'd have to come and say well it should look this way or it should look that way and that's a much more constructive conversation um, so that's kind of what I'm hoping for long term after we work on this stuff is that um, if someone's against development they need to actually articulate specifically helpful things as long as people can argue about density they just say someone's going to tear down my neighbor's house and build a four-story apartment complex and we know that that's not financially viable that that's not you know it's just not a it's just not a helpful conversation but that seems like what the conversation always is right now so changing that part of changing that is getting away from this density language stuff yeah that's that's going to be that'll be the challenge i mean it was it's as i said this for those of you who weren't here during 2017 when we were doing the original zoning these these are the identical arguments that were made in 2017 that said if we pass this zoning 
um, to make the densities match our neighborhoods that people are going to bulldoze the neighborhoods and put in these giant flat roof buildings and they're going to maximize their stuff and and the reality is that there hasn't been any bulldozed buildings um, to do that um, so it's it's you know it's a it's a straw man argument it's really hard to defeat i don't know how much the city council really took that as a as a case as much as it was just the concern about um, not having enough information and I think I think we just if we could make the same case we just need to if, if we're gonna make the case we've got to go through bring the graphics bring bring the other arguments as to why this density argument and have it graphically there um, and I think we could make a better case for it um, so I think that's that's a little bit of where I think that'll go next time around do we have, is it, is there precedent, like, are we allowed to host, like, a workshop thing? Does it have to be a public hearing if we wanted to, like, do some more thorough education about what we mean and the research that we're, you know, make this a more thorough interactive process? Um, or does it have to be in the hearing format? It doesn't have to be in a hearing format. I think if... I think if we were going to do it, you know, my professional recommendation would be we find a third party person, maybe CNU and AARP to come in and give that presentation because it really takes the wind out of the sails when they're relying on this CNU recommendation to go through and say, yeah, we shouldn't be doing this because CNU said we shouldn't do it. And I think if CNU were actually there giving the presentation, they would say, well, you know, actually, if you made these three changes to your zoning, then you should remove it. Well, that starts to become really hard for the opponents to then turn around and go through and say, yeah, but I still don't like that, that removing the residential density. But if, you know, if we get a, if we've got a consultant come in, like, you know, Congress for New Urbanism or somebody else who's affiliated with the group to kind of come in and say, these are the three changes you'd have to make to your zoning in order to be able to to remove residential densities in a manner that's not going to risk loss of neighborhood character. Yeah. In which case we then go through and say, okay, that's what we'll do. We will adopt these three or four changes and, um, and, and put this back through and then, and then see what they do. Um, because then it becomes a much harder case because it's like, Hey, we went right back to them. We got the recommendations, and here it is. It's compliant with what CNU says, and uh, let's yeah, get that. Yeah. Well, I'd be kind of. I think I'd be in favor of some sort of something like that. You know, when we're ready, um, something other than a hearing where we feel like it's not just we have to listen to to written or or, or feedback, but we can actually have try to have more of a conversation. I think we can interact with people, um, and uh, I think I think I, I I definitely want to interact with with the public more of, and just and just put in people's minds some of these issues and have that come from us and um, like Marcella like anything that that you could do to like if you if you felt like writing something to reach out or asking like like I hear what you're saying like you want to hear from people and I wonder if we can I mean. We could do the try to set up a workshop thing. Um, we could also we could also reach out to people other ways and um, and just write more. But I think the more the dialogue and the more reaching out, the better. Um, I think we can do it in multiple ways. I think we should. I would be really in favor of us continuously doing that. You know, Seven Days is doing this thing this year where they're writing about the housing problem all year long. I would. I, I assume it's on people's minds, but it's not always. So the more that we can add to, to, to talking about the different parts of it and and asking for, for feedback from the public, um, the better. So if you, yeah, if you have any ideas of like, because um, like setting up a thing with CNU, of course, is going to be like work and it's contingent on whether CNU is responsive to that. Um, but um, and also just like for us to like to reach out, you know, individually and, and do take action that way too. I don't know if you have any ideas for, for how to do that. 
Let's do it. Yeah, I guess my thought was like we would do sort of a we can do a presentation work and a workshop at one of our meetings. Not call it a hearing, you know, just information session sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, I think we I think we should try to do that. Yeah, I mean I feel like there's things I would like to know too, like I would like to understand better what the problem is with the house on Cedar Street and how what we have now is better, specifically. <laughs> From that point of view, like I just don't, I just don't understand it. So it would be nice to be able to have a dialogue to try to understand like more details behind some of the feedback we're getting. I, I think it's really like <laughs> noble of you to like want <laughs> to like, hear people's views because when i hear the criticisms of cedar street i just hear like subjectively i think it's ugly and because i have a profession related to how houses are made i'm the world expert on what's pretty well i uh, i don't <laughs> agree that the house on cedar street is ugly i think it's just fine and i think it's it's nice that there are four additional units on that street. I also think I'm the only, well, I don't know about Jeff and Gabe, actually. I was the only renter on the Planning Commission for a while, and I think... I'm, I'm a renter now. I do okay. rent. Okay, great. So now there's a few of us, and I think maybe we could, I think we have an important perspective of what the housing stock is actually like <laughs> in Montpelier, um, which I think perhaps gets lost in feels to me as a renter, as a person, individual, not so much on the planning commission, but feels to me as a person listening to that, listening to the feedback. So it does feel like it gets lost and we haven't really heard from anybody who's renting. It's all, it's all uh, landowners. So anyways, I do feel like there's room for a conversation and I feel like we kind of got to do that. I mean, that's kind of our job that is our job. Yeah, I think, all kinds of outreach from every different way, workshops, print. Um, yeah, I mean, I really, I just, I'm, and I'm really just like, like, uh, asking everybody in the planning commission, like, let, like, help. Let's. I, th I think there's just a lot to be done with that, and like, let's, let's all just individually work on what we think would be doable, effective ways to do it. Like I said, I'm going to, I'm going to do this one draft thing that could be an article that we could do with the other committees, but you know, I, I'd like to do a lot more of that. And yeah. anybody that wants to take on like, like Marcel, if you want to look into getting a workshop thing together, um, that would be super, that would be so helpful. Um, anything anyone else can come up with to, to, you know, get through to the public about, how like like fixing this housing problem is a huge huge problem and and from our position as being like one part of one city like we're really limited but there's tons we can do though to help but it's like it's gonna take tons because it's a huge huge problem um and just so the more we can talk about that with people to make them understand uh there's a lot of work there i mean people know People know that housing's a problem, but then when something comes up with this solar shading thing, for instance, they're like, well, you know, my personal value is like, I'm more of an environmentalist than a housing advocate. So like, it's like, yeah, but this is like killer for housing potentially. Like, and it's just, we still don't have people um, there in their minds when they're thinking about these tensions uh, to realize that like more barriers for housing is, the wrong direction and uh, yeah, honestly, I hear, yeah, yeah, I, know. Go ahead. I hear you. I also, I think people have legit concerns though. And we have to meet people where they're at. It's not so much that we have to make them understand what we, what we understand. And I'm not sure that I even understand all that completely, but we have to, it has to be a community conversation. I mean, we're just, it, it just has to be. Yeah, it, I just I, 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 like right now from what we've seen recently with these like hearings, it's like if that's I don't think that that's a community conversation, though. That's no, I just, agree with you. Yeah. And I don't I think that that's why I'm thinking of a workshop, because I don't know that the hearing process really 
because it puts this like sense of urgency on it that potentially is not real, but it creates like, oh, we're at the hearing stage already. And that elevates it for people up to, you know, the point where folks are going to get, they're going to feel so threatened that they're going to be angry or whatever. It's going to come out in certain ways. So I think if we could back it back to something that isn't called a hearing, I, I wonder if that would help. I would think that that would help a little in certain circumstances. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. If you if you would like start. Um, yeah, I can. And, yeah, and I and I um, just on a very practical. I am pretty underwater with CVRPC through April um, because I'm chairing the nominating committee, and that needs to get done by May. <laughs> so I have. I, I'm pretty underwater through April, but I, I don't want to, I can definitely try to come back into this after that. Okay. Shout sure. out to Gabe, who's going to start going to the meetings. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that should help a lot. Uh, so yeah, everyone else, um, you know, Marcella talks about the workshop, like any other ideas to get outreach going out there. Um, just i just know it's a, it's a need and like there's no such thing as too much of it right now um uh, okay. if I could, uh just one thing um such a big part of this conversation there are people who aren't even here yet because there's no housing or they're in the future when the town is say more developed uh yada 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 so i'm wondering who would be who, who who would be a good stakeholder representative for those who have not benefited from the policies that or not policies, uh, uh, our work that we have done or will do to uh, promote more housing? Because That's I a feel good that, question. yeah, and you know we can't constrain this community so much just to serve the existing residents um, as diverse opinions they may have. Um, but yeah, I, I think targeting or thinking about that, um, that group of people who will be calling Montpelier home is crucial to moving this forward, or at least instilling, you know, look to this group that will be coming along. I think, th I think about that a lot and it's why when we, when we put together proposals, uh, that are very pro housing going forward, we need to reach out to. Um, I know there's um, like a rural development um, nonprofits and other nonprofits that are like a state state nonprofits state um, and maybe the regional planning commission, but they have an awkward role where they're I'm not sure how much they'd be willing to pressure Montpelier to do one thing or another. But like um, there's definitely nonprofit agent the organizations that are trying to see housing in the state, and then they would see the regional aspect of it. Um, us as members of the planning commission can be that role. I think, um, Jeff, like, I think that if we go and talk to city council about our duty as part of a region, um, that that ha would have weight. Lauren and I talked about that in our conversation, um, that we have a regional duty as an urban center to provide housing. Um, because if it doesn't happen here, it's going to be undesirable development potentially um and it's bad for the environment and it's bad for the economy and it's you know yeah everything that's behind planning and smart growth and stuff but yeah please think more about who to reach out to for that i know i have one or two ideas um from people i know but anybody else that there, there are stakeholders though Finding them and getting them involved in the conversation is big. Uh, okay, well, I think we've kind of we've kind of been that step, but we know this, this revisiting the CNU thing and then this side task from Anne are two things that have come up, and then we're going to have to the side task being that you know the uh, uh, reviewing the RB applicants based on reputation. Um, like those are two things that we've got coming up that are not part of this city plan stuff we're trying to do. So that stuff's coming up. Uh, 
if I can find my agenda here. So then, okay, so so I think we've talked about that quite enough. Um, I'm gonna hand it back to you, Mike, for, to talk about the Elks Club. Yeah, this is just a quick update. So I will also be making a presentation on Wednesday to city council on um, how to plan for and implement large projects. Uh, as many of you know, um, the city approved a bond to purchase the former Elks Club, the golf course. Um, so that's gonna be a big, uh, a big undertaking for the city and for the planning department. And so the first thing we wanted to be able to do was to start to have a conversation about how to do big projects because it's, um, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions and there are a lot of right ways and wrong ways of doing large projects. And I've, I've done a number of them, mostly in Barry City. So we're kind of just trying to lay things out um, as to how you need to just frame yourself and get yourself ready for these big projects. And it's really gonna be um, a, a three-step process. I always break it into plan, prepare, implement. The first step is to develop a conceptual plan, a master plan for the area, um, and get everybody on board and agree that's what we're gonna do. And then, then the second year, and that'll take a whole year, the second year you do your preparation steps, and then the third year you're gonna be working on implementing that plan. Um, so, you know, it really helps to get people to think, you know, this isn't anything we're jumping on um, building this year or next year. It's something that if you're gonna do it right, you really gotta slow down and, and really take the time. Um, you know, if you're a private developer, you don't have to take public comment and you can move forward faster, but being a public municipality, it's gonna take time. So I just need to give a presentation to council and to the public on what are the next steps that we need to take? How do you do big projects so you can actually get them to completion in a relatively short period of time? And while you think three years is a long time, um, the projects that tend to jump around are projects where you get, you know, let's, let's go get the money to build the project first and then we'll design a project that matches the amount of money that we have. That, that never gets you the project you want. That gets you something less than that. So, um, I always encourage people to, to go through a planning process, decide what the conceptual plan is, and then we continue to refine that plan as we move through the preparation and get ready for implementation. So um, that's a lot of the message of what I want to have with the planning if, with the city council. But if you stick around for the zoning discussion on Wednesday and, and you decide you want to stick around a little bit longer, you can watch that presentation. Um, and then we're eventually gonna get some very specific recommendations for what we want council to approve so we can start to move forward. We wanna hire a consultant. Um, we wanna basically direct the city manager to develop an RFP to review and hire a consultant to manage the development of the conceptual plan. So that's really the outcome of where we're going. So we'll kind of take a little bit out of the planning department. Um, we're busy, we've got a lot going on. Um, I want to continue to be focused on getting this master plan going and wrapped up. So uh, I'll, I'll still be involved in the Elk Club process, but we want to be able to hand it over to somebody who can coordinate all of that process. So that's it for, for my staff updates. Um, as I said, I don't have anything for the economic development chapter, um, but if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take questions otherwise. We can move on to the minutes, I guess. Anybody have anything for Mike or anything additional about the updates? Okay. Yeah. Um, there's nothing new with the, the city plan stuff. So we're, uh, and we're running out of time. So um, I think it's probably best for us to yeah, move to the minutes, um, approve those, and then we can pattern. Um, so, uh, if everyone could take a look at the minutes from March 14th and when you're ready, we'll take a motion to approve those or make any changes first. Uh, so moved.
We'll take a second one. Second. Ready. Okay. We have a motion from Jeff to approve the minutes and a second from Marcella. Does anyone have any discussion or changes they'd like before we vote? Anybody need another minute? Okay, those in favor of approving the minutes say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, and it's approved. Okay, so we have some busy time ahead. Hope everybody's ready. Um, do we have a motion to adjourn? Before we before we do that, just John, I'll be in touch with you through email. So when you're ready, just email me tonight, and we'll get this together. Sounds good. I was just getting the sun angle on uh, on December twenty first here at one p.m. It's twenty two over twenty two degrees. Thanks for doing that, John. <laughs> I'll. Uh, I'll send it around. Yeah. I've got a, I've uh, got a cool model here. Okay, for for me, please send like the main points of discussion for the letter. And uh, um, what if I I'll just send a cool conference. looking map with no words? <laughs> See how helpful that is. Have a good night. Very artistic. Um. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So we'll get that together. John, I'll get that together. Uh, and I will do my best and maybe hopefully Mike will also help because I don't feel like I have the technical background to talk about this. Well, so I just want to say the main points, which is this, this bad, what we say good. Um, okay. Anyway, so do we have a motion to adjourn? Yeah. Motion to adjourn. Motion for Marcella. Do we have a second? Aaron, come on. Don't be oh, can shy. I pressure somebody to make a second? Is that like frowned upon? Second. Yeah, I think I think <laughs> we should have a more of a bully approach from now on. That'd be good. Did we get a second from Aaron there? Yeah. I, I second it. Come on, let's do this. Okay. <laughs> Shut up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> now he's bullying me. Uh, okay. Those in favor of the journey, say aye. 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 Okay, we'll see you guys in two weeks. Hopefully we'll see you on Wednesday. Bye.